Hello, and I welcome all of you to this master class, which we have specially designed for all our students. And I am very happy to say that we have a lot of students from our old sessions who have already passed PGMPs. And now, like everybody, they are helping all our new students to be part of this thing and making this journey have successful for everyone. Am I audible to everyone? And you can see my screen. Yes, clear. Okay, very good. Clear. Good. So I think we should wait one more minute. A lot of students are in the waiting list. Okay, they will do it. Okay, so once again, I welcome all of you. Starting with this thing, first of all, I would like to introduce myself. I will be your facilitator for this master class. My name is Abdul Rahim Sami. And I, from the PMI certifica certifications, I have done PGMP, ACP, PBA, PMP, and RMP. And I, technical, I am master's in electrical engineering. And currently, I am facilitating the PGMP sessions for this course. So starting with the thing, what is a program? Can anyone tell me what do you feel about the program? Anyone, please raise your hands. Yes, please, group Amir sir. Group of projects. Okay. So starting with the definition of program, a program is something which can have components. The component can be a project or a subsidiary program, but the key characteristics of these components is that they all must be interdependent, interrelated, and time-bound. This is what we know, you all are PMPs, we know from projects. Projects are uh, temporary endeavors undertaken to produce a unique product, service, or output. So same is the case in the program. We can have a components. These components can either be projects or can either be a subsidiary program. And what is the difference between a portfolio and a program is operations. Operations is not part of the program. Operations can un come under portfolio. So portfolio can have programs, it can have projects, and it also has the operation work. So our domain that we are studying now is program management professional. Here we are looking only at the program level. We are not looking at the portfolio level. So the first thing we have to understand here is that it will have a component, components which are projects and pro subsidiary programs with no operations. And the key point is that, can you please unmute? And the key point is that operations doesn't have a time limit, so it will come under the portfolio. Is it clear to everyone? Please, everyone, yes. mute yourself. Okay. So that is our domain in which we will be operating here. So we have a portfolio and program distinctions, which is relatedness and time. Relatedness means... Aditya, please mute. Aditya. Okay. So here we have relatedness and time. If I come to portfolio, in the portfolio, the work included 
is related in any way the portfolio owner chooses. On the other hand, in a program, the work included is interdependent. So the key word that we have to remember here is interdependency between the components of the program. And the second distinction is time. Portfolios are not expected to be constrained to end on a specific date. Why? Because it has operations under it. Whereas on the other side, programs like projects are temporary and include the concept of time as expect of the work. So now we have two keywords. Everybody, you can write on your notebooks that the key word difference between a portfolio and a program is relatedness and time. Okay. So that is our basic how we are grouping the components in the program. Okay. So now this is a question to everyone. In the answer, in the chat box, please give the answer. Okay. What we have covered till now. What is the purpose of portfolio management? Just type your answers in the chat box. So here the question is asking, what is the purpose of portfolio management? A is to manage a collection of related programs and operational services to achieve strategic objectives. To manage a single program that spans multiple organizations. C to manage a group of unrelated projects to optimize resource utilization with a specific time limit. And D is to manage the delivery of only multiple operation projects within an organization. Okay, so in this, the correct answer is A, which means collection of related programs and operational services to achieve strategic objectives. And it has no limitation of, of any linking between the components and also no limitation on the time bound. So that's why operation is part of the portfolio. So this concept of portfolio and program is clear to everyone. Just give me your uh, thumbs up in the on your screen. Okay, perfect, good. I think uh, Sami, I just wanted to get yes. here to just uh, so more than getting this right, I think what we should focus in discussing is why the other ones are wrong. So I think. Uh, if we can make that discussion and uh, try to rule out all the wrong ones, that would be the right way. Instead of going into the right answer first and sticking to it, yes, I please. think we'll have Raj to focus on. Yeah, yeah sure. Uh, Rajan, you continue with option B, C, and D. Yeah. So if I, if I say, why not B, to manage a single program that spans multiple organizations, why, why, why that? is wrong. We'll have a discussion. It's a, it's a, there's nothing right or wrong. I think mm -hmm. the whole point here is uh, why do we think that B is wrong? Okay. Oh, this is Jay Pragar. So the clarification for the point number B is wrong. It's, it says to manage a single program. So portfolio management is mainly the correction of programs. So that is the reason only we say B is the wrong answer. Okay. So, the, okay. Any, any, another red hearing that what I see is that multiple organizations. Yeah. yeah. Portfolio That's is usually that. aligned to a single organization and uh, goals. Yeah. So that's, that's, that's more still. If yeah. you go to C, 
to manage group of unrelated projects to optimize resource utilization with a specific time limit. Because the portfolio management, there is no time limit because it is incorporating the operational management. And moreover, it is not to focusing of uh, optimize the resources utilization. That is it can be, it can, it can be. Uh, you, you, it's just not one factor. But what I what I see as a red herring is that I can have related projects, I can have unrelated projects in a portfolio. There is no necessity that it should just be an unrelated project. Mm. But the bottleneck here is specific time limit. The portfolio is not born from the time limit and the key distinction between a program and portfolio is time bound also. So yes. he is wrong because of specific time limit which is restricting you to finish on a specific end time. And now D. Right. So to manage the delivery of operation. I have a project. question. Yes, Gulzasa. Uh, I want to uh, know that the word related programs is making a little confusion here. Uh, the programs can be unrelated also in the portfolio. Yes. Not necessary that they are the related objectives. Yes, right. Though the best answer, best alternative is A, but if the word related is removed, it will make the no. choice more comprehensive. No, because we are, I'm asking what is the portfolio management? So in the portfolio, I need to have, I, I don't need a time bound and I don't need related projects. The question is asking about the portfolio mm -hmm. management, not program management. Yes, sir. The, what is the purpose of portfolio management? And we are selecting a, the collection of related programs. It yes. Can be unrelated. Yes, right. It can be unrelated programs or related programs. Yes, you are right. Correct. That's, that's, that's not the criteria to create a portfolio. So that cannot be considered. So yes. You're right. And the D is to manage the delivery of only multiple only operation operations. projects with inauguration. Here the problem is only multiple operations because we can have yeah. operations and program and projects and everything. So the key distinction is relatedness, strict boundaries for the program. We have strict boundaries that all the components have to be related and time bound. Whereas in the portfolio we have open. We are we can have related programs, unrelated programs, we can have time bound and not time bound. Right? Is it clear to everyone? And one more thing. Suppose the A is yes. the answer. Suppose if the A to manage a collection of related and unrelated programs and operation service to achieve the strategy objectives. That is also the correct, correct answer, right? Yes, it's also correct. Yeah. In portfolio, we have the freedom to have related or unrelated programs. Oh, fine. Right? So, uh, yes. uh, very, very good input. Okay. Now we now our focus from now onwards is only on our program phase. Okay. So starting with the program phase, we have three phases in any program, which is program definition phase, program delivery phase, and program closure phase. So I request everyone to write it down because this is our foundation for this class. The three phases of the program are program definition phase, program delivery phase, and the program closure phase. Under the program definition phase, we have two subphases, which is program formulation subphase and program planning subphase. Further, we will see what are the activities we will be doing in the program formulation subphase and what are the activities we are doing under the program planning subphase. But over the top, we have the same program definition phase. Then we go into the program delivery phase. In the program delivery phase, the key points that we have to understand is here we are talking about all the components of my program. What is a component that I have explained? Component can either be a project or a subsidiary program. Anything which is part of my program, in general PMI terms, it's as a component. The most important thing to understand here is that the component has its complete life cycle under my program delivery phase. What are the surfaces? Authorization and planning, oversight and integration, transition and closure. Any component which is part of the program will be initiated, planned, executed, 
monitored and controlled and closed in my program delivery phase. I cannot close my program delivery phase unless all the components have been closed. I cannot start or initiate any component unless my program delivery phase has started. So in broader terms, I would say I will be doing something in the program definition phase. I will be making some documents here that will guide me and advise me what I have to do in the program delivery phase. And what are those components? We will see later, but the uh, business case, charter, program management plans. This is made in the definition phase. Then we come to the delivery phase where we work on all the components. Once all the components have been closed, then we can go to the program closure phase in which we are again working at the program level. So I would say that program definition phase and program closure phase are working at the program level. We are consolidating everything and working, looking at the program level things directly. And at the in the delivery phase, we are working at all the components. And these components can be any number of components that we have in our program. So coming to this, this is the crux of PMP or PGMP. We have five performance domains in PGMP. Please, all everybody write it down on your papers. We have a program lifecycle. This is number one performance domain. Then we have program strategy alignment, program strategy alignment, program benefits management. Number four is program stakeholder engagement. And number five is program governance. These five domains means your five chapters in PGMP coursework. Whatever we will be doing in any of these four domains has to be overlapped with the program lifecycle domain. If you can understand this concept, then a lot of uh, course is very easy to understand from the PGMP perspective. Okay. So what we are doing here, if I zoom it more, this red line I have shown like a program boundary. We have a program definition phase in which I have program formulation subphase and program planning subphase. So first of all, I will be focusing on the program definition phase and more specifically in the program formulation subphase. Under the program strategic climate domain, First of all, I make the program business case. Then I make the program charter. Then I make the program roadmap. These three are the documents that I am making under the program strategic alignment domain and more specifically under my program formulation surface. Is it clear to everyone? We are making business case, charter and the roadmap. Yes, Professor Sir. Sir, I have a question. Yes. The program mandate is issued before the program or formulation phase, right? Yes. And 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 once the program mandate has been given to the program manager, then he prepares a charter and gets his program approved. Once he makes a business case. Business case oh, sorry, is oh, sorry, business, the, business case, case is the interface document within with your program and what is outside your program. So what is okay. outside your program is at the organization level. At this yes. initial stage, we have organizational strategic objectives where we will make the program high level roadmap, okay, where we will have program mandates, like you said, anything which is coming of organization goals and objectives, strategic plans, everything is outside of a program domain. Everything is here in the white color. Whenever I will make a program, my first interface document is the business case. This is the document where I start or initiate my strategic alignment and this is my starting point. So in other words, if we are in any phase of my program and there is any organizational change that occurs that is uh, meant to be changed your program. So first of all, we will update our business case. So business case is the first document that we are making for my program lifecycle. And then subsequently, I will make the charter, then I will make the roadmap keeping in view the environmental assessments. Environmental assessments are the same that you all know from the PMP, which are 
not under the direct control of the program team and but they are external factors. So we will not go into the detail of this environmental assessments, EES, but these are the same from PMP, keeping in view program risk management strategies in which we will have a detailed discussion from our co-coordinator, Mr. Gulzar. He will give a better view of the risk. But at this moment, only remember there's three documents that we are preparing here. Is it clear? Strategic climate is clear to everyone, the first domain. Just give your thumbs up. Okay. The second domain is program benefits management. The second domain is program benefits management. Here, what we are doing, the first step that we are making here is benefits identification. So when I will identify the benefits, I will document these benefits. And this will go in which of the document is right in the chat box. Once I identify the benefits, where I will write those benefits. Benefits register, correct. So same is the case. If we are identifying any risk, it will go to the risk register. Similarly, when I will identify the benefits, it will go to the benefit register. So in this program, also always keep in mind this on the top side. We are working in the program formulation surface, okay? Here, first of all, we identify the benefits, which is going to the benefit register. Then for every component, I will do benefit analysis and planning and benefits delivery. So these two steps, which are in the benefits management domain are done for every component. So I will have benefits management plan here. They will guide me how I have to achieve the benefits, what I will do to get the benefits out of my components and subsequently the programs. Then they will be delivering the benefits. They will be delivering the benefits. And then we will have benefits transition and benefit sustainment. The important thing to see here is that everybody please focus on the sheet. That benefit Analysis and planning will start when we are in the program planning surface. We are here in the program planning surface. We can start to make the plan because in the pro plan program planning surface, I am making program management plan. And program management plan will have benefits management plan as its subcomponent. And benefits will be started to be delivered for every component during my program delivery phase. At any moment, I can deliver the benefits for the component one here. Component two can be delivered anywhere here. Component N can be delivered anywhere here. Okay. And once all the components have delivered their benefits, then only I can close the program delivery phase. The condition to close the program delivery phase is that all the components must have delivered their benefits. Then only I am able to close the benefits in the program delivery phase. And then benefits transition will start. This is again at the program level. All the delivery that is done will be start to have benefits transition. And then we do the benefit sustainment. So if I zoom it out, benefits sustainment, this arrow, the blue one, is the only arrow in the whole PGMP which is crossing my red line. What is my red line? It's a program boundary. So it means that benefit sustainment is the only activity which will be continued even after the program has been closed. So a lot of questions will come from this topic of benefit sustainment because that is the only activity which is continued even after the program has been closed. What, what is done within the program? Here we will make the benefit sustainment plan. We will make the sustainable budgets, a lot of planning things will be done here within the program life cycle. And then after the program has been delivered, then the benefits will be continued to be sustained because that is how I started my program. And one imp other important thing to see here is that we have a program manager. Okay, he is our key stakeholder. You are all program managers that you are doing this course. Your life cycle is between the red lines. Program manager is only working within the program domain. He is not available after the program line. So it means here the benefit sustainment is done by operations manager at the organization level, any other person, not the program manager. Is it clear to everyone? 
Yes, please. Sir, I am just a clarification that the benefit transition starts uh, within the program delivery and it yes. can continue until the program closes. Yes. Is it right? Yes, correct. Why? Yes, why? The reason is that these components are not born to deliver the benefits at the same time. I can have incremental delivery of the benefits. So, for example, this component delivered the benefits here as per my roadmap and the milestone. Then the transition can start for the benefits for their component. I can pick the, uh, that's why in the program delivery phase, the transitioning is starting. We are allowing every component to deliver the benefits at any time during the program delivery phase as per their milestones on the program roadmap. Clear? Clear. So once any component will deliver the benefits, the benefit transition can start. That's why the transition already started under the program delivery phase. It will continue in the draw program closure phase once we hand go to the sustainment. And then sustainment is the only thing which will be continued after the program life cycle has been closed. The fourth domain is program stakeholder engagement. Program stakeholder engagement. What we are doing in the stakeholder engagement is stakeholder identification. So once I will identify the stakeholders, where I will document this data of the stakeholders? Please write in the chat box. Once I identify the stakeholders, where I will put the names of those identified stakeholders? Stakeholder register, right. So. Here I will make the stakeholder register where I will have a list of all the stakeholders and then I will analyze the stakeholder. I will do stakeholder analysis. So the output of the stakeholder analysis is again the stakeholder register but an updated stakeholder register much more polished having much more uh, categorization of the stakeholders. In this stakeholder analysis we will study in detail we can do we can apply power interest grid. We can apply a lot of different techniques to categorize and to uh, see more of the stakeholders, how they are performing, what are their roles in that. And then I will do stakeholder engagement planning. The output here will be stakeholder engagement plan. And I have to keep the stakeholder engagement and stakeholder communication throughout my program lifecycle. If I zoom it out to see the from the life cycle in the program definition phase this is the planning subface if i bring this line down stakeholder has three steps under the program definition phase which is stakeholder identification means making a stakeholder register stakeholder analysis which means polishing a stakeholder register and making the stakeholder engagement plan and i am doing stakeholder engagement and stakeholder communication throughout the life cycle now i have a question here the engagement plan is prepared here in the end of this planning phase. So how, why I need to do stakeholder engagement here? Why I'm doing the stakeholder engagement from the beginning? Why? Anyone? Raise your hand. The question is that stakeholder engagement is done from the start of the program life cycle. Why we are doing the stakeholder engagement here and stakeholder communication in this area in the program formulation surface? Okay, uh, because in the program planning phase, mm -hmm. we are started to write a business case, right? Yes. So in that area onwards, we are planning, uh, we are engaging the stakeholder. Okay. Mujasa sir. Sir, because uh, when we start the project, we already have uh, identified the high level stakeholders, the most important one. We start engaging with them. And then as we go along, we find we keep on discovering more and more stakeholders. So we keep on engaging them throughout the project. So that's why the engagement starts from the very beginning. Right. Any other person wants to give the input? Yes, Gulga sir. Sure. I think different stakeholders have their different stake in the program, different phases. That's why identifying the stakeholders early is required and also analyzing analysis of the stakeholders is required. 
excellent so as everybody said we are engaging the stakeholders throughout from the beginning because whenever we are identifying the benefits in the benefits identification also i need to ask the stakeholders what are the benefits that you are expecting from my program when i am making the business case i am coordinating with all the available stakeholders i am discussing with them i am asking with them what uh, are their requirements what they expect from me so the stakeholders are engaged and communicated throughout the program life cycle as soon as the program life cycle is started right then the last domain is program governance what do what do you mean by governance anyone what is the meaning of governance governance means controlling okay controlling activities any other person what is the meaning of governance yes yeah, gulzar sir governance is governance uh, means the checking the success criteria and uh, checking whether the phases i have met the success criteria right then giving the go ahead for the close out of that phase and the uh, uh, next initiation of the next phase right okay governance actually means controlling making sure that whatever we have planned for the program is undertaken is following the same procedures protocols for what it is required to be done so in the governance first of all in the program definition phase i will define governance practices and here i will get the program governance plan this governance plan will be the starting point how i will govern my program how i will manage everything under my program and then the governance roles governance roles means who are the people who are the stakeholders who are responsible to make sure the governance is performed this can be program manager they will be program steering committee they will be project managers they will be sponsors a lot of stakeholders will be study in the stakeholder domain but governance roles are basically the people the stakeholders who will make sure that governance are is implemented and governance principles are there and governance design and implementation is throughout the program life cycle which makes sure that at any every stage any phase at every phase of my program i am making sure that governance is implemented and everybody is under the control and everything activity what we are doing here is uh, uh, is there okay so summarizing this main performance domains how they interact with each other how they work on this thing rajan can you please give explain us in your words about this uh, five domains all right so if we take the first life cycle uh, let's talk about this uh, formulation so whatever that we discussed is out of this formulation what do i get i get first the business case as the artifact i get the project charter as the artifact program charter i ah program charter as the program charter as the artifact stakeholder register benefit registers so all these four i get out of it more importantly i think uh, the program manager is being assigned and he takes control of the program so i think that's that's the key factor that we need to look at when i do a program formulation now moving to the next thing is in terms of planning now i have the business case i have the program charter so next thing is uh, i try to create a plans when i say plans it is not uh, it's a integrated program plan where it would be a subsidiary of all our uh, resource management plan quality management cost risk so all the uh, subsidiary plans yes, we go ahead and create all right so then we have a set of plans now we'll have to run the engine now we have this program delivery so program delivery is where 
I create component business case or component is getting generated. So we will have to differentiate between what we do at the delivery phase and what kind of business case is being created at the program formulation phase. Here, we would actually try to create a business case for the components, which is not the work of the program manager, rather it's the work of the project manager. But you will do the facilitation work, interact with all your project managers, and make sure that is in line based on the schedule plan, cost plan, and all that stuff. So here, the components are not a kind of linear sequential way of being done. All programs or all projects within the program can start and end at different times. No matter which project ends or which uh, project starts, it starts only from the delivery phase. When I close, when I say the program delivery phase is closed, that means I have completed, closed all projects. That differentiation we should be able to understand. So once I, 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 I try to move towards the closure phase, before that, like what Sami was saying is that there's a governance thing, right? So in this governance, first you will have to get it from the sponsor or from the program steering committee that can I move to the closure phase? That's more important. So I just cannot on our will and wish, we can just move to the closure phase. We'll have to get a concurrence from the steering committee more importantly, to make sure that my all my projects are in as per plan completed, shall I move it? So only once the program steering committee gives a go ahead, you will actually start the closure activities. So in your closure activities is more of a kind of an, uh, getting your lessons learned, right? Getting your, uh, so there are the, the eco steps are right there. So that's sequence. So uh, I don't remember that eco uh, points, but only for this closure, we will have to remember the steps that we do for the closure. So the eco steps should be remembered of what I will do first, what I will do next, what I will do last. So that steps only from the eco perspective for the closure phase, we should be very mindful and remember that steps. So basically here, what we will we do? We will, we will try to make sure that we update already from the project standpoint, there would have been a lesson learned. Now with all the stakeholders of the project or all the stakeholders of the program, again, we will look at the cumulative lessons learned uh, registry to find out is there anything that we can improve. And that will get pumped on to the organization's lessons register or if all the risks that are being identified, but we have not responded or we have not uh, catered to, that un I, an, uh, uncatered risk will again move to the organization risk register. And there are some closure activities in terms of procurement and all that financial stuff will get closed. So, uh, uh, so what I'm trying to say here is that we'll have to differentiate between each phase, what we do, more importantly, on what artifact we will be able to get out of that. So that's the point that we'll have to remember. And sustainment is something that will happen even after the program closes. And that's 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 why we run the program. So, yeah. Very good. Thank you very, very much, Rajan. Yes, yeah, Gulzar, sir. Rajan said that uh, as part of program delivery phase, when we are doing the component initiation and planning, the business case uh, is developed. Mm. Uh, I think the business case and benefit management plan for the components, like project, they are pre-project documents, right? So will they be part of the program delivery phase or they will be before the delivery phase? No, the so business case. Right. Project charter, I agree. Project charter can be a part of uh, program delivery phase or component uh, planning and initiation. But uh, talking about the business case, I want to clarify. When, when we say business case, it is not program business case. What I was trying to talk to just make sure differentiation between. So I have created a program business case, right? No, no. At, I, just, at the, I understand you right. are talking about the component business case. Correct. I want to confirm that component business case is part of program delivery phase or it's pre-program delivery phase. Uh, it, I, it, it, can't, it can't be a pre-program delivery phase. So, you, you get a high level. 
so the program business case is a kind of an high level what the program will deliver. Talking about, but like yes, I'm talking about component business. I, I, I get your question. So I get your question. So when we create a program business case, it's a high level of what the program will deliver. It is not going to under, give us a pro projection of what each project is going to give. But when we come to this program delivery phase, it's the role of the project manager. Say, for example, there's some kind of a digital servicing that happens. That's a separate project. So that project manager is going to identify why this project is being created. And then it is a responsibility of the project manager, not for the program manager. So you cannot uh, sync when I create a program business case, I can't create a project business case. So we are, we are thinking about a component or we are thinking about a project only when you come to the delivery phase and not during the formulation. Phase. Okay, I would like to add here one thing, Gulzasa. I got your question very correctly. You see here, we are talking about the program boundary. Okay, under the program boundary, I am making the program business case, program charter under the program formulation phase here. First, sorry, is it clear? First thing. Yeah. Okay. When I talk about the project, then I will look into the project boundary from the PMB perspective. Okay. I am talking now about the project life cycle. In their project life cycle, what we have studied in PMP, if this is a project boundary, the first document is a project charter. This is the first document I'm making in the project boundary, right? In PMP, the project business case is part of need assessment, which is actually done outside of my project boundary which is covered under the certification of PBA that we do the need assessment. Why we need to start this project? We have option number one, two, three, and four. We are, we are analyzing everything. In PMP perspective, that project business case is outside the project boundary. And my first document is project charter. Agreed? Right. Agreed. Now, Agreed. And now we come to this component. And this component, Agreed. this component is a project. Okay, here the exactly. first document theoretically should be project charter. But mm -hmm. keep in mind, mm -hmm. all the projects will not be under a program. If I say mm -hmm. that, like you said, program, the project business case will be here, means before this case. That would be correct if we are talking only about the project. Okay, because, on project. yes, if you, uh, you understand my point. If I, so yeah, what, yeah. what Rajan had, uh, explained to us, under the program, we only come to yeah, know yeah. about the projects in my program delivery, in my program delivery phase, this is the starting point. So that's why here in general, we have written authorization and planning. From PGMP right. perspective, authorization means business case, charter, everything which is related to the project, any project life cycle path is coming under my program delivery phase. Is it clear? Clear, clear. So if it was all, if if it would have been only the project boundary, then I will agree that it will be behind that. And in that case, okay. also we don't know that it's a program phase or only the portfolio and the organization thing. But for the right. exam yeah. perspective on the, the program, whenever they talk about the project or the component, it has to be under my program delivery phase. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Clear, yes. clear, clear to everyone. Because everybody is PMP here. If anybody wants to add in this concept or have any question, please ask. You can raise your hand and ask the question if anything is not clear under these five domains that we have explained. Program life cycle, program strategic alignment, program benefits management, program stakeholder engagement, and program governance. The most documents we are making under the program definition phase, starting with business case, charter, and the program roadmap, making benefit register and stakeholder register and program governance plan under the programming uh, program planning surface i am making a program uh, management plan and then component everything is coming under a program delivery phase for the component and then we go to the program closure phase yes jay prakash you have any question i have one question actually business yes business case overall business case uh, is a program business case and another one is uh, in inside the delivery phase, that is also on business case, right? That, but that is for the component so, or the project? The component of the project. Who will create this business case under the delivery phase or overall business case? The responsibility lies with the component managers 
in coordination with the program manager because every project every component will have his own project manager just like pmp in pmp who was making the charter who was making working and needs everything for their component is the responsibility of the relevant component manager with overall supervision and support from the program manager because he is under your umbrella of the program but the life cycle of the complete component will be the responsibility of the project manager okay yeah. this overall this case is developed by program manager in coordination with the steering committee no the, don't get confused with steering committee steering committee is overall there but the responsible the key word of responsibility is with the program manager the steering committee will approve it authorize it that is for sure clear but in the when we are talking only about who is making it the responsibility lies with the program manager and for the okay. component so the lies with the component managers and the project managers at the lower level so it, it it means the program business case developed by the program manager in the delivery phase the business case developed by the project manager in coordination with the program manager right yes right correct Okay, fine. Because consider every component as a project, like you have done in PMP. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. Understood. Clear. Now, the question on your screen, please answer in the chat box. which of the following is not one of the five program management domains as defined by pmi a is program risk management b program benefits management c program stakeholder engagement d program governance so everybody is giving the correct answer which is a the five the domains that we have is program life cycle program strategic alignment program benefits management program stakeholder engagement and program governance under the pgmp so the risk management as a separate domain is not included in our pgmp course but risk is mentioned and covered everywhere throughout my program life cycle we will have a detailed discussion on the risk in uh, short time okay. is it the basic concept clear to everyone please i need a please write yes in the chat box from everyone we have 25 participants please write if and everything that we have covered till now is clear to everyone no question nothing else about the five domains the intersection inter interrelation with each other what we are making in every phase what are the five domains what is a business case charter and road map everything is clear okay very good so now i request everybody to take one page and one paper pencil and page with you now in the i am going to make the magic grid which is not in any book which is not in any of pmi standard but as a summary of the activities that we are doing throughout our program life cycle we have developed this very special magic grid that will help you to cover the complete activities which is going on in your program life cycle okay so please take your paper and pencil make five columns don't look at my sheet okay this is just the overview i will announce for you then we will discuss i will explain how easy it is to understand the complete activities okay make five columns in the first column write the knowledge areas write knowledge areas in the second column write program formulation surface activities program formulation surface in the third column write program planning surface activities in the fourth column write program delivery phase activities in the fifth column write program closure phase so the five columns are knowledge area program formulation surface program planning surface 
program delivery phase and program closure phase. Okay, so now I will uh, ask the person because all our PMP is here. We have 10 knowledge areas in PMP. Can anyone tell me, Abu Bakr, can you tell me what is the first knowledge area in PMP, in the magic table of PMP? Abu Bakr Javed. Scope? No. What was the first knowledge area in PMP magic grid? Anyone? Who is PMP? What is the integration? The first knowledge area was integration. So in your table, please write first row as integration. Please write your first row in your table that you just made. First would be integration. Ajay, what was the second domain? Scope. Scope. Integration is number one. Number two is scope. Anika, what was number three domain? Anika. Okay, schedule. <laughs> then we have cost. Cost, please write three times. Please write cost three times. Because we have more activities. So for easy reference, write cost three times. <coughs> Mazin, are you with us? Mazin? Okay, cost, quality, communication, resources, risk, procurement, What was the last knowledge area in PMP group? What was the last one? Anyone? Stakeholder, correct, right stakeholder. After procurement on your sheet, right stakeholder. And then at the end, write change and information. Change and then information. Okay, so now everybody, uh, please write how many column, how many rows you have now, starting from integration, schedule, uh, integration, scope. Yes, anyone can repeat, please. How many, how, how many rows you have written? Thirteen. Should be fourteen. 14. Anyone 14. having fourteen rows? Anyone who has fourteen rows? Marius. Marius, are you with us? Okay, Mr. Sahib, how many how many rows you have now? Okay. Anyone who has who has fourteen rows can can you raise your hand? Anyone who has fourteen rows? Integration, scope, schedule. Yes, Abu Bakr, please. The first one is integration. Yes. Then scope, schedule, cost, cost, and then cost. Quality, communication, resources, risk, procurement, stakeholder, change, and final information. Excellent. Perfect. Now, starting with integration, put cross in front of all the columns. Integration in program formation phase is cross, planning subface is cross, delivery phase is cross, closure phase is cross. Because in PGMP, we are not standing integration under this life cycles okay integration is all cross and in your 11th 12th row is stakeholder also put cross 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 in stakeholder why because in pgmp we have a specific individual domain of stakeholders so we will not cover it under the program life cycle activities so there is no activity in integration there is no activity in stakeholders 
clear integration is all four columns is crossed and stakeholder all columns are crossed now come to scope in the scope in the program formulation surface i am doing assessment so just write assessment the actual full name is program scope assessment i will be doing the scope assessment then under the planning surface i will be doing management planning scope management planning in the program delivery phase i will be doing monitoring and controlling in the program delivery phase for the scope i will be doing monitoring and controlling and in the program closure phase is cross which means as rajan explained you before they will be doing a lot of activity in the closure phase but there is no activity for the scope in the program closure phase clear next come to the row of schedule in the schedule in the program formulation phase i am doing assessment in the planning sub phase we are doing management planning in the delivery phase we are doing monitoring and controlling in the closure phase is no activity is cross in the first row of cost first row of cost in the program formulation sub phase we are doing initial cost estimate in the first cost we are doing initial cost estimate in the planning sub phase we do cost estimate in the delivery phase we do financial management and in the closure phase we do financial closure in the second row of cost in the program formulation phase is no activity in the planning sub phase we have financial framework establishment just write financial framework in the program delivery phase is no activity closure phase is no activity in the third row of cost in the formulation phase sub phase is no activity in the planning sub phase we have financial management planning delivery phase is no activity closure phase is no activity is everybody with me everybody is following if something is not clear just raise your hand okay in the quality knowledge area under the program formulation sub phase we have assessment in the planning sub phase we are doing management planning in the delivery phase we are doing quality assurance and quality control closure phase is no activity cross in communication knowledge area in the formulation sub phase we are doing assessment in planning sub phase we are doing management planning in program delivery phase we are doing management and closure phase is no activity yes gulzar sir uh, i want to discuss later with the differentiation between the and the cost in the program formulation sub phase initial cost estimate and the program planning sub phase is cost estimate mm -hmm. this initial cost estimate something like rough order magnitude and yes. cost estimate is budgetary estimate right correct right. yes cost estimate is we will make the program baseline budget here in the planning sub phase right and in the program formulation phase say is rough order of magnitude or a blind guess how you when we are making the business case and the charter thank you okay so we were in the communication in the communication we have assessment in the planning sub, uh, formulation sub phase management planning under the planning sub phase management in the delivery phase and closure phase is no activity in the resources knowledge area in the formulation sub phase we have requirement estimation planning sub phase we have management planning delivery phase we have management and in the closure phase we have transition
under the risk we have initial risk assessment in the planning sub phase we have management planning in the delivery phase we have monitoring and controlling and under the program closure phase we have management and transition for the risk we have management and transition in the closure phase in the, the procurement knowledge area in the formulation sub phase we have assessment in the planning sub phase is management planning in the delivery phase is management and in the closure sub phase we have closure means procurement closure in the stakeholder is all, all cross then we come to the change in change formulation sub phase we have assessment in planning sub phase we have management planning in delivery phase we have monitoring and controlling in the closure phase we have no activity and last in the information knowledge area the planning formulation sub phase we have assessment in the planning sub phase we have management planning in the delivery phase we have management and in the closure phase we have archiving and transition uh, amia kinikar can you tell me how many activities now you have in the program formulation sub phase amia in the program formulation uh, sub phase we have 10 activities how many assessments eight assessments and uh, two estimates what are the two estimates uh, initial uh, sorry uh, initial cost estimate yes and uh, requirements estimate resource requirements estimate perfect so at the end for the summary for easy reference you can write total we have 10 activities in the program formulation surface out of which 10 eight are assessments and two are estimations which are cost estimate and resources we have requirement estimation jay prakash can you please tell me how many activities you have in the program planning surface okay the planning surface total total activities 12 activities right and management planning is 10 activity yes and cost estimate and, and what is the 11th activity the cost estimation is one activity cost estimation yes and what is the 12th one and the financial framework is one total right. 12 perfect so in the program planning sub phase we have 12 activities 10 are management planning one is cost estimate one is financial framework mudassar sahab how many activities we have in the program delivery phase uh in the program delivery phase we have 1 2 3 4 uh 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 9 activities no should be 10 delivery phase we have 10 activities 4 5 6 7 In, so we have uh, scope uh, management yes. and uh, control, schedule management and control, cost financial management, yes, uh, quality uh, QHVC, uh, communication management, risk management, procurement management. Resource, uh, you miss resource. You have missed resource oh, management. Yes, I have missed resource. You are right. Yes. You have missed resource. So how many activities yes. in the delivery phase? Ten. Ten. Ten activities in the delivery phase. How many monitoring and controlling? Uh. One, two, three. Uh, uh, three. No, monitoring and controlling. Four, 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 four. No. Uh, no, sorry, five, five, five. Scope monitoring and controlling, schedule monitoring and controlling, quality assurance and quality control, risk ah, monitoring and controlling, and chain oh, monitoring yes, and controlling. So chain in the delivery monitor. phase, we have ten activities. Five are monitoring yes. and controlling activities. What are other five activities? uh the financial management we yes. have communication management we have procurement management we have information management you have missed have resource, resource yes resource management yeah, resource management. resource so 
in the delivery phase, we have total 10 activities, five are monitoring and controlling, five are management activities. Anybody, uh, Abu Bakr, how many activities you have in the closure phase? In closure phase, uh, there are uh, five activities total, uh, yes. two closure and three transition. Excellent. How, so which, which, are, which are the two closure activities? Uh, financial closure and hmm. procurement closure. Right. And how many transitions? Resource transition, risk transition, and the last one is information transition. Excellent. So how many total activities we have in this magic grid? Please write in the chat box. How many activities we have total? 37. Excellent. 10 activities in formulation phase, 10, 12 activities in planning subphase, 10 activities in the delivery phase, 5 activities in the program closure phase. This is your complete PGMP activities. How you, this is, no, and just to conclude this topic here, look at the screen. Whatever I am doing in the program formulation subphase, I am doing assessments and estimates. I am doing assessments and estimates. And what is the main output I am getting from this formulation subphase? Please write in the chat box. We just discussed before the key outputs, what we, are, we, what we want or the documents we want in the program formulation subphase. What are those documents? Number one, program business case. Number two, program charter. And then we have roadmap, benefit register and stakeholder register, so on and so forth. Okay. So it means from the understanding point of view, we are doing assessments of all these things and estimations in order to make the business case and the charter principally. Okay. In the planning subphase, what the main output I am getting is in the program planning surface, I will get program management plan. I will get program management plan. So in order to make the program management plan, I will be doing the management planning activities of all the knowledge areas. I will do the management planning activities here in the cost. I will get budget as Gurdas have said in schedule. I will get master schedule in scope. I will get work based on structure, but that is a detail that we will not cover in this master class, but just for the overview, the main outputs that we are getting here will be the WBS from scope, master schedule in schedule, budget in the cost, then we have service level agreements in quality, but the main objective is to get the program management plan. Rajan, can you uh, uh, explain me, for example, when we are making the program, what is the inputs available for me in this surface? What are the documents so, that I already have when I'm going to the planning surface? Right. So whatever that that we did in the formulation surface yes. is going to be the uh, input to your planning phase. Right. So, so I will have, of, yes, I will have all the assessments. I will have business case and the charter available for me to do the activities in the planning surface. Is it right? Hello, Rajan, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Okay, Correct. I said that when I'm making going to do the planning surface activities, I will have all the assessments, estimates, business case, charter and roadmap available with me. Once I take it, I will get the program management plan, right? Right. Then what I'm doing in the program delivery phase, Rajan? What is the key point in the delivery phase? Whenever I say program delivery phase, what is the first thing that should come in our mind? So you already have a plan. Now this is the place where you are trying to execute the program or the project. Mm -hmm. So you are going to track it. So you're going to, you will have to ask for the plans, whatever mm -hmm. that you put it in the plan, you're trying to track the program or the project. So you're trying to do monitoring and controlling, making changes to the program management plan. That's the essence. Here. Right, excellent. And the most important here is the program closure phase. I am doing only five activities here and out of five, only two are closure, financial closure and procurement closure. So in the exam, if he will ask you that you are in the program is near completion and you are in the program closure phase, which of the following you will have to close? Scope, schedule, cost, communication. Only cost, financial closure will be done. There is nothing closing for the scope 
no closing for the schedule if we say that once you are the program is near completion and you have a lot of risks still open from your program so what you should do with the remaining risks you will close the risk or you will transition the risk to another organization or to the operations to who will be responsible for sustaining that thing what is the correct answer transition transition you cannot close the risk if i say that a lot of contracts are there for the components and the program is about to be closed so what you should do for the procurements or the contracts transition it to another thing or you need to close it or do nothing close close so and for information he will say that you, you have a lot of data a lot of lessons learned lot of project program documentation available with you as a program manager and the program is going to be closed so what you should do with a lot of these documents uh, throw it away hand over to the client make transition to knowledge repository or some other of sir other option so in that case you have to archive and transition all this information to the knowledge database to knowledge repository is it clear to everyone this magic trick is clear to everyone if you have any question please raise your hand yes mr sir uh, sir i have a question uh, when a component is being closed its information and uh, is going to be transitioned with its closure right we are yes. not going to wait towards the we are not going to wait for the program closure as no. soon as the pro uh, component is being closed we'll uh, we'll archive its information okay that will yes it, it will whatever is related to the component will be done in the program delivery phase that okay. that component project will give its information to the program level okay it will give to the program he will put it there and close itself and thus and then when the program closure phase will start so all the information data will already be available in the program because the delivery phase has been closed so whatever was done for any component he already program manager will have all the data available with him while they were closing it and then in the closure phase he will formally archive the data transition the risk transition the resources close procurement close uh, budget close finance this is what he will do in the closure phase but whatever is done has to be done for the component will be already done and closed in the program delivery phase any question from anyone please raise your hand or write in the chat box if it is clear please write everything clear so we will just cover the program uh, strategic element and then we will take 15 minutes break so this is the cut out of the program strategic element i will just cover what are the important components of business case charter and the roadmap this flow chart we have already discussed in detail in the program now we are going to the detail of the strategic element domain in the strategic alignment domain we are making business case charter and the road map these are the three important documents that we will cover here so this is a mind map hand written mind map for you for the program strategic alignment here the first topic is we are making the program business case we are making the program charter we are making the program road map keeping in view the environmental assessments and doing environmental analysis and doing the program risk management strategy throughout our program life cycle in the program formulation phase we are making business case charter and the road map that is the key crux of this chapter that we will get business case charter and the road map okay so these are the core components of the business case you have to remember only the keywords of the business case that are written here which is number 1 it's a documented economic feasibility it establishes the validity of benefits justification of the resources primary justification document for an investment decision assess the program's investment against the intended benefits means cost benefit analysis describes success criteria describes alternative solutions it is an input to the program charter and the program road map because we saw business case was a first document and after this i will make the charter and the road map 
formal declaration of the value that the program is expected to deliver. It contains high level risk, key assumptions and constraints. Strategy alignment is initiated because I told you before, business case is the first document between the boundary of our program and the organization. So that is the first document in which the strategic alignment is initiated. Serve as a formal declaration of the program benefits, the expected delivery and the justification for the resources that will be expended to deliver it. It establishes the authority, intent, philosophy of the business need and sponsorship, provides direction for structure, guiding principles and organization of the program. So these are the most important keywords for the exam point of view, for understanding point of view, you have to uh, understand for the business case. And the key tone of all these things is the justification document. Which is the first document is a business case where strategic damage is initiated. The document that is an interface between the organization and the program is a business case. That document will be which will define the success criteria for the, is a business case. That will provide the validity of the benefits. That document that will have formal declaration is a business case. Okay, so business case, the key, key word is justification. It is defining you how you are going to start the program. That is your first document in the program, the business case. Clear? The next document is a program charter. What are the elements of a program charter? Authorizes the program management team, assigns and authorizes a program manager, defines program scope, defines the purpose of a proposed program. It has key stakeholders, timing of the program, success factors, high level benefits, goals and objectives. It is derived from a business case because when we are making the charter, business case is already existing. Enable program strategic alignment, used to measure the program success, include metrics for success and a method for measurement, clear definition of success, and links the program to organization's strategic objectives. These are the key words of the program charter, and here the tone is authorization. Whenever you get the keyword of authorization, the document which contain the scope, which contains key stakeholders, contains success factors, high level benefits is a program charter. There is no common word between the business case and the charter. If you are able to differentiate between the keywords of business case and charter, your 30% of the questions from this domain will be clear. Here we have success factors. In business case, I had success criteria. Here I had justification. Here I have authorization. That are the two key differences. Program scope, I never defined in the business case. Key stakeholders were not in the business case. High level benefits were not in the business case. They were cost to benefit analysis was done in the business case. Here we have cost benefit analysis. But when only the benefits will come, it's a program charter. Okay. So these are the two important documents. And the third one in this chapter is a program roadmap. So once you think of a roadmap, the picture of like this road should come in your mind. It says it will tell you the key milestones, where you are delivering, what are when you will deliver some uh, benefits for your program, whether it's for the component or it's for the program level. So what are the keywords? Chronological representation of programs intended direction, chronological, graphically depicting dependencies between major milestones, reflects the linkage between business strategy and the program work. It outlines major program events, only the events, but there are no activities in the roadmap. Very important point. The roadmap will only have the milestones and events, but no detailed activities. The detailed activities are coming in the schedule. Reflects the pace at which benefits are realized. Pace means if the pace of your program is fast, the milestones will be much earlier. So that is how you get the pace of the benefits. Serves as a basis for transition and integration of new capabilities. Assess the program's progress toward achieving its expected benefits. Show how benefits are delivered within major stages of milestones. 
include component details, durations, and contributions, depict how benefits are delivered, effective way to communicate to the stakeholders, visual of return on investment, and defines the linkages between the all the things. So the key words from the roadmap are showing the you the linkages, graphical presentation, visual presentation, chronological representation, showing you the milestones, showing you the pace of the program. That is the key words from the roadmap. So you must understand the difference between a business case, charter, and the roadmap. Then this chapter is and this domain is very easy for you. Any question? Okay. So next do this question. So I have a question. Yes, uh, related to business case and program charter. Yes. Uh, in the business case, uh, uh, I have learned it contains only constraints, not assumptions. But the program charter contains both assumptions and constraints. No, this uh, is same thing. You know, thing uh, okay, okay, let me answer this. In every document that is made under the PMI, whether it's business case, program business case, project business case, charter, everything, high level risk, assumptions, and constraints are in every document. So he will never ask you the question that which document uh, considers level uh, the what risk. Document is the, every, every document. It's common for all PMI. The risk is everywhere. Whatever I am calculating, whenever I am doing the paperwork, whenever I am doing the planning work, I am not certain what would happen in the future. Right? This is the risk. So anything, what any document I will make in the PGMP or PMP or any certification, the risk and exemption and constraints will be there. And there will be no question coming of this thing that which document contains these things. Next question. But this uh, second was related to risk that we have discussed. Okay, clear. So risk is in every document. So now let's do this question. Rajan, you please uh, read the question and answer, then explain us. Okay. What will the program manager do next? An organization is releasing a new technology. The program manager has performed initial program assessment by defining program objectives, requirements, risk. The program manager sponsor has approved the high level roadmap what will the program manager do next? So here, the key word here is that high level roadmap, that's initial program assessment and high level roadmap. So when we say high level roadmap, it is not our what the one that we talked before in terms of program formulation, but this is a more of an high level. So that's the catch here. So what next? So will I go for D, prioritize, analyze, classify program benefits? Uh, uh, absolutely not, because uh, we are at the initial level. Uh, you're just trying to identify what is the benefit. So you just cannot prioritize benefits. Now go to create program roadmap. Roadmap, why will I not take? That's not the first activity in your program formulation activity, right? So I will not use that. Program charter. Again, that's not the first activity that I would do it in program formation. So what is left out is only the business case. So the catch that what we'll have to uh, differentiate here is that roadmap is altogether, program roadmap is altogether different. High level roadmap is altogether different. And here, the key word here is that initial program assessment. When, when we try to start the program, I'm just trying to identify uh, uh, trying to assess whether we can execute this program or not. So A would be the better choice. So very good. The answer here is A and the detailed explanation is already given by Rajan. Very good. Next question. Rajan, continue. Yeah. Which documents key elements are program scope, key stakeholders, success factors, assumptions, that tie the program enabling program strategic alignment. So 
when they say strategic alignment, it can be any of these three documents that what we discussed in terms of formation, right? So risk management plan doesn't come under that. We do risk engagement, but planning happens only during planning, but here it's, it's more of strategic alignment. So that will not be considered. Roadmap again is your milestone, something like a dashboard. What, what time I do what, which component will start at what time, whether I have finished that. So the roadmap will also have the status. So it is not just a one-time activity. Roadmap is something that uh, any at the higher management, they will look at the roadmap to find out the status. So roadmap is again, not the right one. So one differentiating factor in terms of scope and key stakeholders is the differentiating factor between business case and charter. Charter will have not just the scope, inclusions of the scope, what is excluded. That will also have, will be there in your program charter. Key stakeholders, which is called stakeholder considerations. Stakeholder fac factors, again, that will have the success criteria in business case. So, that, so answering the question right is not the objective of this exercise. We'll have to differentiate between a business case and the charter. So we should take time in identifying why it is wrong rather than getting the right answer. I think that's, that's the crux of this answer. Right. This so the correct answer is B, which is a program charter. It has scope, key stakeholders, and success factors, which are the keywords that we just saw in the charter. And last question of this domain. So which document will you present would give the chronological representation of programs intended direction graphically depicting, depicting dependencies between major milestones and decisions points. We have been invited to an annual meeting for your organization. We have been tasked to give a presentation about your ongoing program. So we discussed before, right? Roadmap is something like a dashboard, a status to all the high level management. So that would be the right thing. Planning is within the team. You don't give a plan to a stakeholder and say, this is where we are. Planning is just within our internal team. The stakeholders or the customer is not really worried what plan you have. They're, they're not really worried about that. Charter again is from the same perspective. So roadmap is having some kind of a graphical dashboards of where we are, what is the dependencies, what are the issues. So here the correct answer is C, which is a program roadmap. So excellent, thank you very much. So we will now take 10 minutes break. We meet again, now is a quarter the hour. Somebody has 20, 21, 30, somebody will have different times. So we we'll meet again in 10 minutes and we will start, we will be a short uh, presentation from Mr. Gulzar on the risk topic. And then we will continue with our next topic. So next, uh, see you in 10 minutes. So we are back from the we are back from the break. So starting with the next session, Mr. Gulzar uh, will uh, tell us about the risk. This risk is a uh, generalized topic, which will come in every PMI certification examination. So over to you, Gulzar sir. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you for giving a chance to present risk in the program management. Uh, you know, risk as uh, sir has shown the magic grid. It starts from the formulation and it goes until the program, for the whole program life cycle until the program closing. So the uh, first uh, task is for the program manager coordinating and managing the complex issues arising out of uncertainties related to outcomes and external environment. Risk management uh, strategy, it is umbrella in the formulation stage uh, under which the program charter, program business case, program uh, program roadmap, they are developed under the umbrella of risk management strategy. So the program manager, it is his duty to concede, coordinate, and manage the complex issues which will arise from the uncertainties, which are risk. You know, risk is uncertainty, unexpectancy, future event and it contains the uh, poverty and impact to characteristics, and it also has uh, opportunities and threats. So whatever opportunities are threats related to outcomes of the program are from out of the program, uh, 
environment, external environment, or whatever the opportunity and threats related to the program out of from the external environmental factors that is the responsibility of the program manager to coordinate and manage. The, another responsibility for this lies with the PMO. PMO helps in taking the risk, issues, decision, and managing changes. There are other factors managing changes. They are already discussed and still going on under the program life cycle. But the PMO also helps taking the risk and issues with related to the risk. So when we are talking about the distinctions between program and projects, uncertainty is the main factor with distribution between the program and projects. Uncertainty is very high in the beginning of the program because the program outcomes are not clear in the start of the program. And individual projects, they are considered to be more certain than the programs. And the third thing is also the expected outputs of the program are generally more certain than those of the program outputs at the time of their inception or at the start of the program. Program risk management strategy, as I described that, it comes in the program definition phase, starting from the formulation. And when we are preparing the program business phase, program charter, and program roadmap, the program risk management strategy starts with it. And the other thing is program strategy alignment. Program strategy alignment is a component to me that identifies program outputs and outcomes to provide benefits aligned with the organizational strategic goals and objectives. The main function of the strategic alignment, and especially the risk strategy, is to align the program objectives, program uh, program benefits to the organizational strategic goals and objectives. Identifying the opportunities and benefits to achieve the organization's strategic objectives through program implementation. When we are doing the program life cycle, when we are implementing the program, we are the identification of opportunities and benefits so that the program is aligned with the organization's strategic objectives. You see in the uh, uh, figure below, the program risk management strategy is the, like an umbrella under which the program business case, program charter, and program roadmap are developed. And another factor is environmental, uh, EEF, external environmental factor or suspects. And uh, then these three documents are delivered in the program formulation stage phase. Program business case. First of all, we talk about the program business case. Organization builds strategy to define how their vision will be achieved. The basic objective of organizational strategy is to uh, get the vision of the organization achieved. The completion of the strategic planning cycle results in the creation or update of the organization strategic goals and objectives. In the strategic uh, uh, planning, of the organization to create and update the organization strategy objectives and goals and which are written in the strategic organization strategy plan. The organization vision mission are used as input to the strategic planning to these organization vision and mission. They become input to the organization strategic planning. And remember this is all pro pre-program work before the program starts. And uh, the organization strategic plan is then subdivided when the organization has developed the plan to subdivide it into the organizational initiatives in the forms of portfolio, program, and projects. And these initiatives are influenced by market dynamics, customer and partner returns, shareholder improvement, and mission, organizational stance and weaknesses, maybe based on the risk to the organization and the better plan. And these can be wrote in the so all this was pre program work, organizational vision and mission. They become input to the organization strategic plan in which we write the organization strategic goals and objectives. Considering this, we develop the program risk management strategy under which the business case, charter, and roadmap are developed. Program business case, as Sir has already described, my focus is here that program business case contains the high levels. Despite other factors, market demand, cost benefit analysis, knowledge analysis, the risk 
high level based part part of this document also also we have already discussed now coming to the program charter program charter also contains the high level risk then uh, uh, despite other things specific goals justification program scope what is in and what is outside the program all these deal with the high level risk they are part of the program chart and the program risk Absolutely, this is uh, developed in the program formulation stage and under the umbrella of program risk management strategy. Now, what is the any question, Sandeep? Uh, no, sir. Sorry. Okay. Program risk management uh, strategy. Successful D of the program map. Depends on a well-defined program risk strategy. If the risk strategy is developed very well, then the program roadmap can be delivered very successfully. And that roadmap will be aligned with the organizational strategy and considering the environmental factors following the environmental assessment which we have just learned in the medical grade. Program risk management uh, strategy ensures effective management of risk to ensure alignment of program with the organizational strategy. Effective organizational risk management strategy helps to ensure the alignment of program with the organization strategy. It includes the de definition of the risk threshold considering the organization risk appetite and the initial program risk assessment. And alignment of the program objectives with the portfolio and the project organization objective. Also, the alignment of program roadmap with the portfolio and organization. Developing high level risk enables consistent program risk management and uniformity in communication. So, program risk under program risk management, what are the activities? Risk management for strategy alignment strategy uh, program strategy aligned with the portfolio or with the organization program risk threshold development initial program risk strategy now discuss risk management for strategy alignment involves having a risk management strategy that ensures effective management of any risk that can cause the program to be out of alignment with the organizational strategy. The main objective is to keep the program aligned with the organizational strategy and the risk management strategy basic objective is to having such a risk management strategy which ensures this thing that the end is going to harm the objectives of the organization, they should be aligned with the organizational strategy. Such a risk management strategy includes defining the program risk threshold, performing the initial program risk assessment, developing a high level program risk response strategy, determining how risk will be communicated to strategic level of the organization. If the risk threshold is more than the program, the manager's capacity or role or scope of the program, then it will be escalated to higher level. This is also part of the program risk strategy. Program risk threshold definition is the degree of acceptable variance. Uh, whatever this program stakeholders can absorb the variation from their objectives, that degree of acceptance is called risk threshold. Example of program risk threshold can include the minimum level of risk for a risk rooted in the risk system, whichever risk. Well, it actually distinguishes the risks from the assumption or hypothesis. So whatever there are, are the risks, they will be included in the risk register considering the risk threshold. Qualitative, which risk is high, which is medium, which is low, that is compared with the risk threshold, and then they are written in the risk register as, as an output of qualitative risk analysis. And also quantitative numerical definitions of risk rating also considering the risk threshold. Maximum level of risk exposure that can be managed within the program. Uh, whatever the risk we get, the program manager or the program manager team can manage, which is also uh, well, it is also found out while considering the risk threshold. If the risk is beyond that uh, threshold, it will be 
uh, escalated um, uh, to the higher level. Initial program risk assessment offers a unique opportunity to identify risk to the organizational strategy of alignment, which are risks are making the program detract from the organizational strategy. Identification of these risks is called initial program risk assessment. It is prepared during program definition phase, in the foundation stage. It is critical that the initial program risk assessment identifies any risk to strategy and alignment again. Whatever the whenever the program is getting de-aligned from the organizational strategy, the identification of those risks is, uh, is done in the initial program risk assessment. It is critical that the initial program risk assessment identifies any risk to strategy alignment, which includes but is not limited to any uncertain given submission that if the answer could lead to if there is there are risks which are making the program misaligned from the organizational strategy, then what can happen? Program objectives will not be supportive to the organizational objectives. Program roadmap will not be aligned with the organizational roadmap. Program roadmap will not be supportive to the portfolio roadmap if that program is part of the portfolio. And the program objectives will not be aligned with the portfolio objectives. And the program resources required for the risk management they will not be synced with the organizational capacity and capability. And maybe the organization needs to provide those resources. And at the end, program may fail a greater need. Program risks the response strategy combines the elements of the risk threshold, which we have discussed before, and the initial risk assessment and to aid to develop a plan. That would become the program risk response strategy. An example of organization that use five percent schedule variance as acceptance for them, the risk threshold will be five percent in the schedule delay. The risk will be considered not a significant risk because they have already described that five percent is the threshold for this, and the response strategy will be to accept it. Okay, five percent. So it is in, in terms of five days they can accept the five days delay in the program completion. Once uh, established the program. Yes, Blasa, sir. Thank you very much for your detailed explanation on the risk. I think that this topic is clear thank to everyone. Sir. And uh, thanks a lot for your active. And he's also our trainer for the risk management professional. If anybody wants to enroll with him, just to summarize the topic of risk, whenever the question of the risk will come in any PMI certification exam, you have to follow the steps, as Mr. Guzar has said. The first step is to identify the risk. We put in the risk register at any stage of the program. Once the risk has been identified, your risk register is there. You will have to analyze the risk. And after analyzing the risk, you have to make a risk response strategy. Whenever he will ask you about the question, what you will do with the risk at any stage of the program, we never go directly to the risk response strategy. First, we have to identify the risk, put in the risk register, analyze the risk, then make a risk response strategy and accordingly we move forward. And one more thing uh, to keep in mind is that the, uh, just, the one more thing important to keep in mind is that risk register is a dynamic document. Benefit register is a dynamic document. Stakeholder register is a dynamic document. The meaning of dynamic means they can be updated, they can be referred throughout the program lifecycle, whether it's in the definition phase, delivery phase, or the closure phase. That is the main essence of making all these registers that are available and accessible during the whole lifecycle of the program. So that was Mr. Gulzar, a very good presentation from the risk point of view. Thank you very much. So now we continue with the, our next domain, which is program. Can you see my screen now? Everybody can see my screen. Mm -hmm. Okay, you, now you are seeing the screen of the benefits management domain, right? Uh, you are seeing my screen now? Benefits management. Yes. Okay. Yes. So, in the bene benefits management domain, first of all, we are doing the ben benefit identification from which we will make the benefit register. Then we will make the benefit analysis planning, which means benefits management plan. We will give the uh, we will do the benefits delivery throughout the components. 
and then the benefits transition will start and the benefits sustainment will continue throughout the program uh, life cycle. Okay, I can enlarge. Now coming to this thing, the mind map of this chapter, we have benefits identification, benefit analysis and planning. We will make the benefits management plan. We will uh, deliver the benefits. We will do benefits and program governance throughout the program life cycle. One, two important things to understand. One is strategic alignment. One is value delivery. What does it mean? At every phase of the program, you have to make sure whatever benefits you are about to deliver are aligned with your strategic objectives. And they deliver the value for what it was started. That is a reason sometimes we have to terminate the program because of this, any of these two reasons. Maybe we are making something, we are investing so much, but we are not getting the required value for that. This is useless to invest the thing. Means, in other words, the cost benefit analysis is too high, that the cost is too high, benefits are too less. And on the other side, strategic alignment, as we are under the umbrella of the organizational objectives, then we have the portfolio, then we have the program. So whatever we are operating is under the umbrella of our organizational objectives. Strategic alignment must always be there. Once we are not following these two principles, we have to terminate the program, we have to close our program. Then we have the important document, which is a benefit register. What it contains, collects and lists the planned benefits, measure and communicate the delivery of benefits. It is developed based on the business case. Again, business case is a starting document of my program. It is reviewed with key stakeholders to develop appropriate performance measures mapping of planned benefits to program components as reflected in the program roadmap, KPIs and thresholds for evaluating their achievement, risk assessment and probability for achieving the benefit, status of progress indicator for each benefit, target dates and milestones for benefits achievement, who is responsible for delivering each benefit, and tracking and communication processes necessary to record program progress and report to the stakeholders. Very important concept here is whenever you have to record the progress of the program, whenever he will ask you that which document you will use to communicate the progress of your program, the status of your program, that is a benefit register. Why? Because my objective of starting the program is to get the benefits. What benefits? It is in the benefit register. When I am updating the benefit register, I can easily track these benefits are delivered, these are in progress, that's un that cannot be delivered. So that is the best indication of explaining the status of your program to the stakeholder. Minimum three to four questions will come from this topic of benefit register. This is a very important part of exam content outline also. And every time during the whole life cycle of the program, you have to keep the benefit register updated as per the current status of your program. Then the next important document is benefits management plan. What is contains, it defines the process for creating, maximizing and sustaining the benefits, formally documents the activities necessary for achieving the programs, plan benefits. The main crux of plan is how you will do something. Whenever the answer wants the, any type of a plan in the answer, he will give you the tone in the question of how identifies how and when benefits are expected, baseline document that guides the delivery of benefits, identifies associate activities needed for change driven by the realization of benefits, identifies how and when the transition to an operation state will occur, define each benefit and associated assumptions as I told you, risk and assumptions in every document. Link component outputs to planned program outcomes. Define KPIs and procedure to measure the benefits. Define roles and responsibilities required to manage the benefits. Provides a process for managing the overall management effort. And as the, this is the most important thing, as the benefits management plan is modified to reflect the changes in the program pacing, roadmap is also updated. As we saw in the roadmap, the key crux was the milestones and the pace when we are going to deliver any of the events. So 
in the benefits management plan, if I say that some benefit will be delivered earlier or something will be delivered late, it means I am uh, changing the milestone of my program. So whenever there is a change of when something is going to be delivered, my roadmap will be updated accordingly. Is it clear? Benefits management plan is linked with the roadmap as we will change the when benefits are going to be delivered, it will affect my roadmap and subsequently it will be updated. Benefits delivery phase. It ensures the program delivers the expected benefits as defined in the benefits management plan. Like in any PMA thing, once the plan is made, then only we can go to the delivery phase and the execution phase to deliver something. And the guiding document is always the plan of that domain. So here, benefits management plan is available. It will guide me how I will ensure the delivery of the benefits. Monitoring organizational environment program objectives and benefits realization to ensure that the program remains aligned with the organizational strategic objectives, initiating, performing, transitioning, and closing the components and managing the interdependencies among them. So it means in the program delivery phase has a benefit delivery phase under it. So as we discussed in detail before, anything which occurs on the components will be managed in the delivery phase. So what he has written here, initiating, performing, transitioning and closing components. So whatever will be done, anything on the component will be under the program delivery phase and more specifically under the benefit delivery phase when we are working on each of the components. Evaluating opportunities and threats affecting benefits means the risk. What are to that? Evaluating KPIs, related to program financials, compliance, quality, safety, and stakeholder satisfaction to monitor the key delivery of benefits, recording program progress in benefit register, and reporting to key stakeholders as directed in the communication management plan. Again, the program progress will be registered in the program in the benefit register. Benefit analysis, planning, and delivery have a cyclical, cyclical relationship Keep in mind in any, in any PMI certification, whatever is done has a cyclic relationship among all the phases. Nothing is done in isolation. They are integrated with each other. We will see in the stakeholder domain that like a program manager will have a collaborative relationship with everyone. Nothing, even any activity, neither any stakeholder is working in isolation in any of the phase of your program. Whatever you will do here will be affected somewhere in other thing because of two main perspectives. One, every component is interrelated and interdependent that we saw in the definition of the program. So whenever something, one thing is affected, it will subsequently affect the other thing. And everything is under the umbrella of a program. So everything have a cyclic, cyclical and iterative relationship among each other. Uh, uh, no. Anyone has, yes, please. Any question from anyone? Then the third phase, the second last phase is the benefits transition phase. What we are doing in the benefit transition phase, ensure program benefits are transitioned to operational areas and can be sustained once they are transferred. Here the key word is transferred. Verifying that the integration, transition, and closure of the program and its components meet or exceed the benefit realization criteria. The keyword, more another keyword here is the criteria. Whenever you have to switch over between the phases, whenever you have to switch over between any other thing, you have to make sure that the benefit exit criteria is there. Whenever I'm going to transition something, it means that I have to make sure that my this phase is completed. Now I can hand over transition to some other organization. So that is the benefit criteria or the exit criteria is there. Develop a transition plan to facilitate the ongoing realization of benefits when turned over to the impacted operational areas. Stakeholders in the receiving organizations are identified and participate in the planning. Receiving organization or function is responsible for all preparation processes and activities within their domain to ensure that the product, service, or capability is received and incorporated in the domain. 
there may be multiple transitions even as individual program close that's why we started the program transition phase even in the program delivery phase because there can be multiple components multiple deliveries as soon as the one program component will deliver the benefit we can start to transition it a program may be terminated with no transition to operations and the transition may be from one program to another program and the last topic of this benefit domain is benefit sustainment phase and what uh, uh, can someone told me uh, jay prakash can you tell me what is that important point in the benefit sustainment phase what is the unique thing of this sustainment phase so uh, the benefit sustainment is actually uh, we need to realize the benefits even after the program is closed yes so it means that it will the whatever will be done may, after the yes please the role is completed then the responsibility after that is the operation manager excellent so benefits may be sustained through operations maintenance and new components a benefit sustainment plan should be developed by the program manager and the component project manager during the performance of the program that's why we started the sustainment within our program life cycle actual sustainment work is conducted after the close of the program and is beyond the scope of individual components sure because the components are already closed in the program delivery phase establishing operational support updating technical information in response to frequent frequent project support queries planning transition of support from program management to an operational function planning retirement and phase out of the product or cessation of support with appropriate guidance monitoring any outstanding risks affecting the program benefits so it means that the risk transition is also done in the closure phase and this is the most important concept minimum two questions are coming from this topic develop a business case and the potential initiation of new projects or programs to respond to operational issues whenever you have to make a new program new project anything and it is coming in response to your operational issues it means the program has already closed and relationship to your program in the operational stage is only in the benefit sustainment phase so whatever you will do for any program any project anything new in the operational issues is under the benefit sustainment phase it has no link with your program formulation phase program definition phase program delivery phase or your program closure phase don't get confused with the keyword of a business case that we are making in the program definition phase because here he is talking about business case of new projects and new programs to respond to the operational issues you are already you already have crossed your program boundary and you are in the benefit sustainment phase is this concept clear to everyone jay prakash is it clear what i just said now yeah it's clear yes very good so let's start with the questions of this domain so which is the baseline document that guides the delivery of benefits during the program's performance it also identifies the associate activities processes and systems business case no charter no road map no benefits management plan so here it it is benefits management benefits management plan because the keyword is how we are doing to do something so the correct answer is d in this question next question which document collects and lists the planned benefits for the program and is used to measure and communicate the delivery of benefits throughout the duration of the program it also includes key performance indicators 
and thresholds for evaluating their achievements. The key word here is lists the planned benefits. So whenever we will identify the benefit, we will have to put into a benefit register. So the correct answer here is a benefit register. Which phase involves verifying that the integration, transition, and closure of the program or its components meet or exceed the benefit realization criteria established to achieve the program's strategic objectives? So verifying means benefits transition phase because we can only transition to another phase by verifying once we are crossing from one thing to the another thing. So answer here is a benefit transition phase. And the last question, in which phase of the benefit management is this activity included? Developing business cases and potential initiation of new projects or programs to respond to operational issues with the deployed product, service, or capability being supported or public acceptance to the improvement of legislative changes? The correct answer is D, which is benefit sustainment phase because of the keyword of operational issues. Whenever we will make a new document, new anything, it will be under the benefit sustainment phase. Is benefits topic clear? If anyone has any question, please raise your hand. Amiya, is it clear? Yes, it is. Okay, good. So our next second last domain is program stakeholder engagement is one of the most easiest domain. A lot of questions will come and that we must be able to answer correctly. Here we are doing three uh, steps, critical steps, stakeholder identification, stakeholder analysis and stakeholder engagement planning. We will make a stakeholder register, then we will uh, polish it, update it during the analysis, power interest rate and stakeholder map, and then we will make the stakeholder engagement plan. This is the mind map of this chapter. We are doing identification, engagement planning, engagement and communication throughout the program life cycle. Engagement means to engage the stakeholders, communicate means to talk to them, to communicate and provide them the required information, whatever is needed throughout the program life cycle. Stakeholder register, the key elements are, it lists the stakeholders, categorizes their relationship to the program, ability to influence the program outcome, degree of support for the program, other statistics or attributes, program team uses it for reporting, distributing program deliverables and providing formal and informal communications. It contains politically and legally sensitive information, may have access and review restrictions placed on it, should be appropriately secured, it is a dynamic document. Program manager should prepare and update the register as required. The most important thing here is that the registers that we are making in PGMP are benefit register, risk register, and stakeholder register. Out of these three registers, all are dynamic documents, means they can be updated, referred to throughout the program lifecycle. They are the living documents. But stakeholder register is the only document which is not a public document. Because it contains sensitive information, program manager has to secure it. It should not be accessible to everyone. Only the limited people will have the access on that. So minimum two or three questions will come from this topic of the registers in which he will be asking about the dynamic document. That is all. But which of the following register is not a public document? That the correct answer would be the stakeholder register, benefit register, and risk register are not so sensitive and no, should not be not mandated to be secured and protected. Okay, is it clear? Madrasa Saab, is it clear? Stakeholder register? Yes, sir. Okay, then we have a program stakeholder management plan, uh, analysis. What is the meaning of analysis? Then now we have a long list of stakeholders in the stakeholder register. Now I should know how I have to behave, how I have to interact with different type of stakeholders differently. So what I will do, the program manager categorizes the stakeholders in order to analyze them. Categorization will highlight differences in their needs, 
expectations or influence questionnaires and surveys for a greater number of stakeholders key information should be gathered through open ended questions a prioritized list is developed to focus on who has the most influence positive or negative influence the technique that i will use for analysis is power interest grid which groups stakeholders based on their level of authority power and level of concern or interest regarding the project outcomes or the program outcomes the same thing and stakeholder map is a second technique which visually represent the interaction of all stakeholders current and desired support and influence so whenever we are talking about the two dimensional grid power interest grid is two dimensional only we are analyzing two characteristics of the program of the stakeholders that the answer is a program power interest grid if we have to analyze more than two characteristics geographic language culture anything then we have to use the stakeholder map that's the only difference between this thing and these two techniques we are using to do the stakeholder analysis and even after that doing the analysis the output will be the stakeholder register but it will be the updated stakeholder register which will have much more information and detailed information about every stakeholder with me then we make the stakeholder engagement plan in the stakeholder engagement planning it contains detailed strategy for effective stakeholder engagement includes engagement guidelines provides insight into how the stakeholders are engaged in various components of the program defines the metrics used to measure the performance of stakeholder engagement activities include measures of participation in meetings and other communication channels degree of active or passive support or resistance strive to measure the effectiveness of the engagement in meeting its intended goals provides critical information used in the development of program documentation and its ongoing alignment as the stakeholder changes so in principally this is guiding you how you have to engage the stakeholders how you have to interact how you have to uh, coordinate and communicate with the stakeholders how they will be informed how you have to do something everything is written in the stakeholder engagement plan and that's why we are doing this thing then we are doing program stakeholder engagement throughout the program life cycle it is a continuous program activity because when we saw the flow chart it started from the formulation phase and it will continue towards the program closure phase in every phase stakeholder engagement is coming the stakeholder register map and engagement plan should be referenced and evaluated often and updated as needed with the passage of time it may require facilitated facilitated negotiation sessions to help establish common high level expectations program manager provides appropriate information contained in the program charter and the program business case every way business case and charter are refer referred all the interactions with the stakeholders are logged including meeting invitations attendance minutes of meeting and action items thorough analysis of participation trend is done we can see that how many stakeholders participated in this what was their input and use of an issue log to document prioritize and track issues help the entire program team understand the feedback received from the stakeholders so we are checking and evaluating all the stakeholder engagement steps and the last is program stakeholder communication once we like in this session i engaged you and now we are doing communication everybody is involved in this this is the communication so first we have to engage them then we have to communicate them so communication is at the heart of stakeholder engagement a strategy is crafted for each stakeholder as identified in the stakeholder register because in stakeholder register i now i have done the power interest grid i know which stakeholder needs what type of information and how they need the information somebody will need weekly somebody will need daily reports somebody will need hard copy reports somebody will need only emails questions from curious stakeholders and their answers should be captured and published in a way that allows multiple stakeholders to benefit from the exchange it is a vehicle for information sharing negotiation and collaboration among program team members communication requirements such as what information should be communicated including language format content and level of detail decision making stakeholders 
should be provided with adequate information to make the right decisions at the right time necessary to move the program forward. So program uh, stakeholder engagement and communication is done throughout the program life cycle. The purpose is to keep the stakeholders updated, to get their support, to get their buy-in, and to be engaged and continuously updating them throughout my program progress. Because the purpose why my program can be successful is only if all the stakeholders are updated, informed, and supportive of my program. If I will not communicate with them, they will not be supporting my program and my program cannot be successful. Right? So please read this question. And Rajan, can you, if you help to read it, please. How should the program manager decide which template is appropriate? Component project managers create project management plans for all component projects in the program. The program manager notices that some project managers refer one status report template while others prefer another. Why should the program manager decide which template is appropriate? Need the program governance board to select appropriate template. It's not the work of the program governance board. Program governance board is, is just a facilitator whether we are following the process or not. So it is, it's not a kind of a decision authority of what to yes. take or what not to take. So they will be ruled out. Review the issue with the PMO to determine which template to use. Again, maybe a right answer. We will just keep that on uh, uh, aside. Allow the component project managers to use the preferred template. Now, this cannot be the right answer because each project cannot have a different template. So we should have a single template which facilitates all. So D, we will report. Review the issue with project managers and come to a mutual agreement on which template to use. So here, B and C is somewhat a kind of an, uh, a good uh, choice. So which a. one can we take? A and oh, C sorry. are the, a, a and a and C C are the C. most probable thing. A and C. Yeah. So here, the key stakeholder is program management office, which is always available for your support guidelines and telling you what they provide you the best templates and information things. So here, the correct answer is C. We have to review the issue with the PMO. Whenever we have to use the template, this is one of the most important stakeholders. And this is not a decision making thing. Uh, Rajan explained to you, if something is to be decided, it will be from the governance board of the steering committee. Here we are getting the best practices, best templates. So that in that case, PMO is the correct answer. Whenever you get to uh, get any sharing of the resources, any information support, PMO is always there for you. It will be there minimum two to three questions come from the PMO. Next question. He is accountable for enabling the success of the program. He is referred as champion of the program. Which of the following is the stakeholder that provides resources and support for the program? So anybody who is the champion of the program for the program success, it cannot be program steering community. Okay, so we can leave that off. Again, team members are just going to follow the directions. Mm -hmm. So they may be part of it, but they are, they are not accountable for it. Uh, they may be responsible for it, but they're not accountable yes. for it. Nobody is going to ask a question of why that project failed or why that program mm -hmm. failed or why is it so bad. We will do a lot of So only two things that comes here is uh, one can be a program manager or it can be a program server. So in terms of Always the champion success of the program. I think it is a sponsor, right? Yes, not... right. So and accountability is with sponsor and responsibilities lie with the program manager to do all the work in the program life cycle. And last question, which of the following document is a key in program stakeholder engagement planning? It contains the required details about the stakeholders that have been identified and analyzed. Jay Prakash, what would be the answer? Uh, which of the following document is the key program stakeholder engagement planning? It contains the required details of the stakeholder that have been identified and analyzed. Okay, the state answer stakeholder existence. Right. So, the, anything about the stakeholders are given in the 
stakeholder register. Who is responsible to manage the program level issues by identifying and selecting a course of action consistent with program scope, constraints, and objectives in order to achieve the program benefits? The key word is responsible to manage the issues. Responsibility lies with the program manager. So the correct answer is C, because if this is a decision making thing, it will be with the steering committee. If it is accountable level thing, it will be with the sponsor. If it is only responsibility things, it is with directly with the program manager. Is this concept clear to everyone? Any question till now? Okay. Now the last domain is program governance. It's very simple. Here we are. Uh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Here we are doing defining the first step. We should define the governance practices and governance roles and governance design and implementation. Governance roles are the same. The key stakeholders we have already covered in the governance practices. We will make a governance plan. So this is the mind map in the program governance practices. We have governance plan which have definition of roles and responsibilities, governance meetings, support and services, program governance, vision and mission, goals, program approval, endorsements, business case, success criteria, steering, monitoring and reporting. And then we will define the program governance plan. And under the program governance roles, we have sponsor who has the accountability, steering committee, PMO, program manager, and the project manager. And throughout the program life cycle, we will make sure program governance and design is implemented and in place. The program governance plan describes the systems and methods to be used to monitor, manage, and support a given program. Describe responsibilities of specific roles for ensuring the timely and effective use of those systems. It may be modified as appropriate as I said, any program can be updated. This is not a dynamic uh, thing, okay? So same is with every type of plan. Governance plan is also uh, modified as appropriate. It describes the structure and composition of the group of governance participants, defines roles and responsibility of key stakeholders, defines who will have accountability and authority concerning key decision-making categories and responsibilities who and how is always part of the plan. And we are talking about the accountability and authority so that will be defined in the governance plan. It contains a schedule of anticipated program level governance meetings and key milestones, which are phase gate reviews, health checks, and required audits. Phase gate review is the most important thing that will come in the exam. Minimum five questions will come whenever we are switching over from one phase to another phase. We are closing the program Definition phase, going to the program delivery phase, we will have a phase gate review. Get approval from the steering committee, go to the new phase. When I will have to close the program delivery phase, I have to get uh, approval from the steering committee to make sure that all the components are closed. They have delivered their required benefits. Now I can go to the program closure phase. Health checks means during the whole life cycle, the steering committee and the program manager will look only look to see the, pro the progress of the program and make sure everything is going as per the plan. No decision will be made in the health check. Only you will monitor and look into that. Normally, when the phase is long, when there is a long distance between two phases, program delivery phase is getting long, definition phase is uh, uh, doing wrong, there is a lot of time span going on between the different phases, I have to do the health checks. For example, if I'm making a student, I give him one class today, in one week I make a class. So I cannot leave him open. Every day I'm doing the continuous follow-up. That is actually the health check. I ask you what is the progress, what is the update, this is actually the health check. But we are not making any phase gate review, we are not making any decision. In the next class, when you are done with this one chapter, we start another chapter. That is actually start of a new phase. That is a phase gate review. That's the best example how we are moving forward. And without the continuous follow up, without the health checks, we cannot make sure that the program always remains on track during the whole program life cycle. Is this concept clear? Amiya, is it clear? Phase gate review difference and health check difference. Yes, it is. 
So whenever the question will say about making a decision, switching over between the phases, making a decision point is a phase gate review. And never we will only look into that. Everything is going fine. Uh, looking at the progress of the program, that is a uh, health check. It serves to influence the program management plan, defining the program's requirements for governance, interaction, and review. So we have a program management plan, and governance plan is part of the program management plan. Tells dependencies, assumptions, and constraints, benefits, performance metrics, and measurement, support services, stakeholder engagement, governance practices, authority for program decision making is established. Here we will make a define the program governance board. It will give the authority to the program manager. For example, if in the call terms of a budget, we can say the program manager has the right to approve anything about $1,000. This is the power authority given to the program program manager. Anything which is above the $1,000 has to be escalated to the program steering committee. So whatever is the authority we will give to our key stakeholders will be defined in the program governance plan. Jay Prakash, is it clear? Governance is clear till now? Yeah, we are clear. Okay. Then we have program governance roles in accordance with the program charter. Program manager assumes the responsibility and accountability for effectively managing the programs. So the key governance roles are sponsor, who has accountability, steering committee, which has a decision-making authority, PMO, always available to support you, to guide you, to provide you the templates. Program manager is responsible to make sure everything goes fine in the whole program life cycle. And under, at the end, you have a project manager, which is at the component level. And the last thing is that governance design and implementation throughout the program life cycle. Governance begins with the identification of governance participants and the establishment of governance practices. Sponsor organization seeks to implement governance practices that enable the organization to monitor the program support of the organizational strategy. Then we have legislative environment to look into that. Interaction is performed by elements of corporate governance on behalf of the program. Decision making hierarchy, a highly regarded, successful, and experienced program manager and the team are given greater powers. Same like in your program, when it's a multi million dollar project, you will add the senior person or project managers to that. And everything should be aligned with portfolio and organizational governance. The need for alignment with the organizational governance is greatest in the program definition stage as the program governance and the program itself are being formulated. So in the beginning, we have to make sure everything is aligned with the organization level thing and we need a highest degree of control in the beginning. Same in your, like you discussed, different stages of team formation. In the beginning, you have to make sure everything is going on. Thing. You have to make a lot of governance, lot of control, lot of monitoring throughout the program life cycle also, but it is more in the program formulation phase. So this covers your complete program governance topic and only we will solve two questions and then we close. Uh, Rajan, can you read this? Sure. What is the approach that should be followed to proceed to the next phase of the program? You are a program manager of a program that has multiple components. What is the approach that should be followed to proceed to the next phase of the program? Obtain authorization and approval from governance authorities through stage gate reviews. Okay. Obtain authorization and approval governance through periodic health checks. Obtain authorization and approval from governance authorities by presenting program status. Obtain authorization and approval from governance authorities by evaluating KPIs. So when we move from one phase to other, that means you are in some kind of a formulation phase, you are moving to the next phase. Health check is different, stage mm -hmm. gate is different. Health check is something like an audit, you have some kind of a checklist, mm -hmm. you do something which is quite internal to the program, it's more of a governance things. But stage gate is something that, look, I have, com I have completed my development, I'm going to move to the staging, and then I move to the production. So each phase that you do, you should have some kind of a phase gate checkpoint, 
which will do that. So KPIs you will do every time, right from your start of your program till your end, you're always going to evaluate the KPIs. That is more of a monitoring and control. Mm. So leave it out D. C again, presenting the program status. You will present the program status again any at any point of time. So again, just the status is not going to mm. help you out. Health checks, like what I said, is more about audits. That is something yes. internal to your program, internal to your project or whatever it is. But stage gate is something that an external guy from the quality department is going to see how do I move from one phase to the other. So here the correct a answer is A. So stage gate review or the phase gate reviews we are making where we are changing from one phase to another phase. Excellent. During the monthly progress meeting, governance board ensures that the program is performing well and is on track to achieve the expected program benefits within the above context. Which of the following is the best tool used by the governance board? Governance plan, benefit register, periodic health checks, and phase gate reviews. Here the key word is that they are only ensuring that a program is performing well. It means they are only looking an eye over that. There is no decision in involved in that. So in this case, the correct answer is C, program periodic health checks, which is the correct thing to do to make sure everything is going on track. And the last question, you are the program manager for the construction of a new hospital. In which program phase are constituent projects chartered and initiated by assigning project managers and allocating appropriate resources to achieve program objectives? The key word is that constituent projects. So in which phase we are only discussing about the projects is the program delivery phase, right? Program formulation phase is in the program definition phase. Program definition phase is not correct. Program initial phase is a made up term. Take care of the made up terms and focus on the question whenever you have a constituent components of projects, we are in the program delivery phase. So that covers your complete PGMP masterclass, which we cover all the five performance domains, starting from all the way from program life cycle, covering all the phases of the program, in which we have program definition phase, delivery phase, closure phase, program formulation subphase, program planning subphase. In the delivery phase, we are talking about all the components starting with the three subphases, component authorization and planning, component oversight integration, component transition and closure. Once everything is closed, program delivery phase is closed. Then we go to the program closure phase in which we are doing the activities. We covered the 37 activities in the magic grid which had 10 activities in the program formulation surface, eight assessments, two estimations. We went to the program planning surface in which we had 12 activities, 10 management planning, one cost estimate, one financial framework establishment. Then we went to the program delivery phase and we, we talk about all the components. We had 10 activities in that thing, five monitoring and controlling, five management activities. Then we closed the program with five activities having two closure phase activities and three transition activities. And then we went to the strategic alignment domain. We made business case charter and the roadmap. In the benefits, we made benefit register. We made benefits management plan. We did benefit transition, benefit sustainment, crossing the program life cycle. Then in the strategy, stakeholder domain, we identified the stakeholders, made the stakeholder register, analyzed them, made the stakeholder engagement plan, Stakeholder engagement and communication continued throughout the program life cycle. At the end, we looked into the governors in which we defined governance practices, defined governance role. We had the governance plan to make sure we make the phase gate reviews and periodic health checks to make sure a program is completed on time and successfully. That was complete PGMP for you. Now, Mr. Amir, you can take over. Thank you. Thank you very much. First of all, I really appreciate Mr. Sam, please give me access of most that really appreciate everybody for more almost three or which shows so much uh, consistency from you guys i'm really happy to see some of the certified program managers here and some of the future program manager good to see you jay prakash good to see you abu bakar amir hamza pradeep mudassir atif everyone here one of the thing that i really say that and I also want to add here for all those people who are watching right now and will also watch it later. We always believe to give more than ever take from the world. 
and that is why we are the only one who are doing coaching calls for PGMP. But for all students, we regularly post it. This session, which is was supposed to be closed, we have opened it for everyone. And the goal remains same. We want to make sure that more and more people become certified program manager. That is our number one goal. And I still remember when we started doing program management. Uh, almost one and a half year when we started doing it. And I am very happy to say that we will be reaching more than 30, 30 zero PGMP by the end of this year. Three zero PGMP. So it may look like when you compare my PMP number, which is 550 as a small number. But let me just put some emphasis on this number. I know for a fact, very good trainers, very big trainers for last 10 years, you don't have 20 PGMP. They don't have 20 PGMPs to show. And why we have 30 PGMPs and let me make sure every single one Every single one. This is something special. I don't even add with PMP, not even with RMP. And I am very happy to say it on record. We have 100% success record for program management. 100% success record in first attempt. In first, highest in the world. But the reason I'm um, emphasizing it, the way we are working is not this thing. Why there are only 5,000 to 200 PGMPs in the world and 1.70 million PMP. Okay. And let me tell you this thing. PGMP, in my personal opinion, is the most prestigious certification, not only by PMI, have any certification all over. There are other certification also, but PGMP is the most prestigious certification. It is one of the most harder certification and one of the most prestigious certification. Let me add why it is, uh, Mr. Sam, if you can give me access, thank no, you. you. One of the biggest reason of the PGMP is, PGMP is divided into three parts. The first part is application. Now, the, why, why the application is a problem thing? You see, PMP application is one part. You put 500 words, okay? Put initiation, planning, execution, monitoring and control, and that's it. PMI... Uh, look your at your application you may be audited but that's it when it comes to program management application the application size is six times first you write down program management application okay pgmp application overview just like pmp then then we go towards the next in instant the next instant is so interesting and that is so beautiful mr sami has told you just overview of five domain benefit governance why don't you put in the chat box all that domains life cycle stakeholder all those five domains all those five domains you need to write 500 words 500 500 500 words now that is the one thing i hope you can use chat gpt things like that and i hope you do that you use all those things and you have written the application here comes the most beautiful thing what PMI has done and why I really love this certification. Once you submit the application, the application goes to PMI and PMI take 15 days, up to 15 days just to review the application. Your application is complete or not. Just to review that your application is complete or not. Okay, 15 days they take it. Once they have taken the 15 days, then they will tell you, okay, now your application is complete. They will only check the completeness of application, nothing else. Nothing else. If you something is missing, they may ask you. Otherwise, they said, okay, now pay the exam fees. If you are a PMI member, the exam fees is $800 for all over the world, but it is less in India, Pakistan, and in some other countries. Okay, that you can you even if you are Indian but you are in a uh, UAE or Gulf, Jay Prakash, it will be eight hundred dollar. But if you are Indian and you plan to give exam in India, then Amaya the price will be different. Okay, so and now the PMI checks you before you book the exam that where are you going to give the exam. 
So that's a different story. But for you, consider it 800 for members and 1000 for non-members. Now, once you, now you have to submit the fee. Once you have submitted the fee, let's say $1,000, you have submitted the fees. Here comes the interesting part. The application goes to panel ready. Here, actually, program managers like Mr. Abdurrahim, like Rajan, like me, PMI send application to them. Those who have volunteered them that we want to review the application. PMI send your application to them and those people review your application. Here, most of the people's application got rejected because they actually read it. They actually read it. And now with everyone using chat GPT, like somebody put a status on LinkedIn, I'm using chat GPT, I can tell in one second. Anyone can do that. What we do here, I will explain in two, three minutes, but let's say your application goes to PMI and they take two months to review it. And after two months, if your application get rejected, they will give you a chance. Either you can update it or you, you can get your money back. Being fair. And then let's say if it is accepted, then you have to prepare and give the exam. And now an astonishing factor. I told you we had 100% success rate. All over the world, all over the world, PGMP passing rate is less than 50. Even after getting application approved, preparing and going for the exam. Why? Because there is no one to coach. And you know well, that's when I did PGMP. I was reluctant to do PGMP, to be very true. Because all of you know that we are so much bombarded with PMP and I'm obsessed with that. But when we started PGMP, we wanted to make sure that this became special. Guys, can you hear me? Please put something in the comment. Yeah, I guess I got lost there. Okay. So what we did, we made a success coaching system for PGMP. Okay. We have two programs, one-to-one -one program and group. First of all, I will give you overview and I can explain both programs for you guys. What we did basically, let's say you join our one-to-one -one program. First, Mr. Abdurrahim, he will sit with you understand your program and help you writing the entire application. Entire application. Once you have written the application, like how we write the application, he will give you one domain. He will explain you. You will write that. He will review. Then you will review. And then he will send me and two other people who will review it. And then one by one, one by one, one by one, we complete the entire application. We complete the entire application after review. Like even I, I'll tell you, I was traveling today. Mr. Sambit last night sent me one of the application and he said to review. I said, him, I am jet lagging. I am not in my face. I will review it tomorrow. It is that important. It is that important. I want to look in and I don't think so. There has been any single application where we did not tweet it a little bit. Right, Mr. Abdurrahim? We review, we tweet a little bit. Yes. Little bit here or there. Let's improve this. Let's improve this. And I'm going to tell you a small story. My application was audited and rejected after two months of it. That is so interesting. <laughs> My application was rejected. But now for last 30 PGMPs, every single person's application got accepted in the first attempt. And now... When the application goes from us, PMI accept within one week. Why? Because now we have developed that system that we give them in that template that they want, in a format that they want. And that is why it's just like that. Let's say your subordinate is not writing report. You give him a format, he write in the language that you understand. And that's what Mr. Abdurrahim and we have developed that template. Once your application is submitted, for sure, we'll make sure that it get approved. Once your application get approved, then comes the most important thing. We will provide you training for each topic. Coaching, we will have minimum one coaching call a week and then a customized roadmap according to you. For example, yeah, Mudassir is here. So Mudassir, when he joined the program, he recently did PMP. He said, I want to clear PGMP by the end of this year. And he will be clearing. I'm telling on record by the end of this year. 
His application recently got approved. Okay. So he will be clearing coaching call, customize the roadmap, follow Mr. Rahimi. And then one of the most important things that you need to understand is quality of question. We have more than 2000 questions for PGMPs. For PGMPs. And now we are making more and more questions, more and more questions. We will give you first questions on PDFs so that you don't have to worry about the timer. You don't have to worry about the timer. Once you are done with those questions, then we will go towards the next question on the simulator. Very important question on the simulator. Okay. And the entire thing we have given in one pack. And today I want to surprise you with one thing. You know, all of you know that we don't have to read any book in our programs, but we are writing books for those people as a souvenir very soon, probably in the next, by the end of the first quarter, you will be seeing the first book program management also very soon. Just for you guys, uh, those who are a student, everything will be in one package. Okay. This is, I am announcing it for the first time. Very soon you will see that just like PMP, PGMP book will be available. Mr. Sami is working very hard on that. And you will see that as just like PMP. And we will make sure also that is available all over the world. It will take time, but we'll make sure. Now let's talk about the cost part of both program. One-to-one -one program is $1,500. Group program is $999. Our program fees are fixed. We we have decided it multi, uh, like five years back that we are not, for our, all the programs, we want to focus on value. We want to focus on values. And this is an open challenge to anyone who is watching. Go to any person whose success story or who has tagged me, who has taken my, and ask the feedback, what we do. And ask this question, is it expensive? And then you will realize the hard work we put it. So that's why we focused on the value and made the price fix for you for the entire program. You want to go for one-to-one? -one? Sure. You want to go for group? Sure. Both programs are there for you. Whichever the program you like, we can work with that program and we can provide you training accordingly. Just to summarize the entire thing, these are everything that you will be getting. Guaranteed application approval. That is our thing. We'll make sure your application get approved. We will have minimum one coaching call in a week. Okay. We will do follow up with you. We will give you a customized roadmap. We will give you the best simulator. The next group program is starting on 19th of January. We are increasing the price of PMP, but for next year, the price for program management remains same. And the goal for the next year is getting 100 PGMP. 100 VGMPs. It is almost an impossible goal. I know Mr. Sami was having discussion with me that I have to wake up 3 a.m. to make this presentation for you guys. So that goal to make sure that you really become PGMP really materialized. So if anyone wants to join it, please contact us. You have my email, you have my WhatsApp number and we'll make sure that at SA Project Management Services, success is correct. That is our show. Thank you very much, Mr. Abdul Rahim. Thank you very much, everyone joining. Uh, and I really appreciate on Sunday, you are sitting there. That shows the motivation. Please, for anyone who says that they want to look for a cheap program, I can actually tell you, you can get a $10 program. But if you want an end-to-end -end support, then only contact us. Then only contact us. Because if you want a free, actually, there are a lot of or material place that you can study. You can study standard ECOs. But if you want end-to-end -end support, you can get it. Okay. If your application is approved and you want only simulator, we do provide that. You only want coaching calls. You just you say, okay, I want to study myself, but I want the coaching call. But uh, let me tell you, that will be more expensive for you. The entire package, if I go part, 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 that becomes $4,000. $4,000. If you get the complete package, that is very well for you. Thank you very much, Mr. Abdul Rahim. Thank, thank you, you very much. much. So before we close, yeah. I would like to thank all our participants here who are in, la who are in large number. Special thanks to Mr. Rajan and Guzar for uh, helping me in conducting this session. This is the essence, as Mr. Amit always says, each one teach one.
So thank you very much, Rajan, to be uh, with thank us, you supporting, all. providing your valuable feedback, Mr. Guzar. Thank you very much, and also best wishes to our upcoming, uh, very soon project man program managers. We have Mudassar, Amiya, Jay Prakash. They all are working very hard day and night. We are working on their applications, on their thing, and uh, thank you very much for attending it for this three hours PDUs. You will be getting from Mr. Amit. He will share you the certificate or the link how you, which you can use on your. PMI website to renew any of your certification. If somebody is a PGMP, they will use this code for getting three uh, PDU for PGMP. And if you book for PGMP, automatically it will go to PMP also. And if you are only PMP, then you will book this three hours under the technical knowledge, knowledge experience. It will be going to your uh, uh, in your P, uh, PMP renewal cycle. So that's all from my side. Thanks a lot for attending it. Have a good day and best wishes for all of you. Amir, if you want to conclude. Thank you. Thank you. You did it. Everyone did awesome. Thank you very much. And see you guys. And as I, as I always say, good morning, good evening, good night. Assalamualaikum. Namaste. Sasriya Kal, wherever you are. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.